Hey y'all, I'm here today with another Science Simplified for you guys. So today we're going to go over mm -hmm, behavioral correlates of successful weight reduction over three years, results from the Lean Habit Study. So this is a really cool study uh, by Wessenhofer, who I love. A lot of the research that I used for my project initially was from him, so shout out to Wessenhofer. Uh, and you know, this is actually a really short study. It's literally two pages because it's just a kind of an overview of what they found for these behavior correlates. But I think that they speak volumes uh, just for this type of research in general. So I wanted to go over it. Now today will be a little bit shorter unless I just blow on and you know how I do, but I've honestly been trying to make them short. I've only made three other videos. So the first two I thought were pretty good timing, and then the last one was a little bit longer than I would have liked. Uh, um, if you guys didn't watch that, that was Metabolic Adaptations for Athletes, which was an Eric Trexler article, which I loved. So definitely go watch that if you haven't. It's full of information, but it was a review and it was really practical to the audience. So I really didn't leave much out from the paper. So it ended up being a little bit longer than I wanted. So moving forward, uh, please let me know you guys if you want to see kind of like part one, part two videos, or if you'd rather just have long videos. So let me know in the comments below because you know, like today is a short one. There's gonna be other ones that are shorter in general, but there are papers that I wanna do. Like I have this McLean review that I really wanna do, but there is no way that that is going to be like a one part video uh, just because it's so massive and there's so much information. But just in general, do you guys like longer videos or do you like shorter ones, maybe like under 10 minutes, something along those lines. So let me know you guys' thoughts below and let's get into this. So sometimes I like to paraphrase and then other times I like to read directly from the study because I think certain things are just really powerful and I never want to take that away from what the authors wrote. So really awesome, I think, first line is long-term results for obesity treatment are generally disappointing, period. Just like, bam, that is the introduction sentence. <laughs> and I mean, to be honest, a lot of the research that we will see uh, from, from me at least that I'll be talking about yeah, that's kind of what it shows. It's pretty grim. Weight loss research really isn't that uh, conclusive, 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 and most time people regain weight. So what they're doing is they're trying to look at behavior correlates for long-term weight uh, maintenance, which I think is, or weight long-term, successful long-term weight reduction, which I guess in my opinion would be weight maintenance. But this is awesome because it was three years that they followed people. So that's why I wanted to show you guys this. It was called the Lean Habits Study. And what they did, subjects were recruited from 400 different centers in Germany, it was a BCM diet program, which essentially is just a commercial weight loss program. So this was in 2000 that it started. It was a three years, so 2000, 2003. So, I mean, to be honest, I don't really know how popular those types of places are anymore, but back then I could imagine that it probably would be. Typically it was just, kind of counseling within like a group setting. It was very open, you know, kind of come and go as you please. Uh, it was led by physicians and it was mostly focusing on behavior change. Uh, they met every two weeks. They said in here that the average duration was four to five months for participation, which isn't too bad, but you know, 16 to 20 weeks, maybe not be long enough for behavior change. And then they did say that in the beginning, there was two meals per day replaced with a formula diet at the start of the program. So again, not really sure as far as like a nutrition standpoint, what they were recommending or things like that. Also, this is, was in 2000, so you know nutrition has evolved since then, but in any case, they were looking more at the behavior changes. So they looked at body weight, but they also measured eight different behavior correlates, which is essentially what they were looking at for this study. So I think that they're really, really applicable to this population, which is you know overweight dieting population. I think it's really applicable to physique athletes. I think it's really applicable just to general population. Okay, so the first thing they looked at was rigid and flexible control of eating behaviors. So I've talked about this before, but rigid is more of this black and white, all or nothing thinking, where you will you know restrict food groups and things of that nature. And then this flexible approach is more of the in between moderate, you know, graduated type approach, and for weight control. And I think that this is such an important phrase, oh my gosh, I love this, which is understood as a permanent task. How important is this for any kind of you know diet behavior? Uh, a lot of people will look at this as transient and it's not. When you're looking to lose weight, whether you're normal weight, overweight, obese, whatever it is, this is a lifelong commitment. Now there's obviously gonna be days and fluctuations, but understood as a permanent task, I think is one of the best phrases that I could ever put together in a, in a sentence structure. So I'm really cool that I stumbled upon this. I'm really happy that I stumbled upon this. Uh, I will definitely be using that in future talks. 
meal rhythm, which essentially was just looking at kind of meal timing, the frequency of that, and avoidance of snacking and nibbling. So just kind of like, do they have normal meal behaviors versus maybe just grazing all day where people can overconsume. Meal situations, you know, how you respond when you're eating, you know, are you standing, are you distracted, you know, what are you doing? Again, things that are, can contribute to overall, like, higher calorie consumption. Food choices, you know, and again, I could argue this, but just for the purposes of the study, avoidance of fatty foods or sweets, and preferences of vegetables and fruit. Of course, you know, we're going to have people on here like, oh, well, you know you can eat fatty foods, okay, of course, you guys, but they're just talking about in general, you know, higher calorie foods for people who are overweight, do you avoid those versus having maybe more nutrient-dense food? Restriction of quantity of food, which is pretty self-explanatory. Physical activity, it's also pretty self-explanatory. And then I liked this one a lot, coping with stress. So just, you know, the subjective feeling of stress, how you're handling it, and also are you managing emotionally induced eating episodes, which is huge for people. So that, I think, is really important. They took the baseline assessment, of course. Then they did a 10-week follow-up, which in this paper is denoted as FU in all caps, so that's pretty funny, or I just have a really childish sense of humor, but FU is everywhere in this paper. I'm just like, wait, what? 10 week F you. <laughs> uh, so 10 weeks, then they did one year, two year, and three year. So awesome follow-up data, you guys. It, anytime you read a study that has follow-up data, I mean, that's just like amazing. So three years is like pff, nuts. When they started this, they had 6,857 subjects, like hello. Uh, I mean, they recruited from over 400 centers. So ex <sighs> understandably, there's a lot of subjects. And then at the end of the three years, they had 1,593 subjects. Within that three-year period, some things got lost in translation, so some people's uh, files weren't complete. So out of all of those, 1,247 subjects had complete data from all of those time points. So that's still a lot of people, so that's awesome that there is even a sample size that large. Something also important to look at in the methods, which you know they delineate here, and in most research papers, they will, so look out for this. Uh, weight loss of 5% or more from baseline to three years, F you, was defined as successful weight reduction. For the purpose of analyses, the sample was divided into two subgroups with or without successful three-year weight reduction. So they're just kind of defining terms. So if you see that later, you know, you have to kind of think back to reading that. So usually stuff like that will be in the methods. For anyone who's interested in reading research, that's a little helpful tidbit. Percentage of women in the sample was 89.3%. Not surprising, uh, just based on the, where they were getting the data from, I wouldn't suspect many males to be in that kind of a weight loss setting. Uh, and also just, you know, females are highly overrepresented in weight loss research because traditionally more females are engaging in weight loss type behaviors. So I just wanted to point that out and then also the average BMI was 31. There was plus or minus deviations of about five, but still for the most part these people were, you know, overweight and obese individual. So again, taking this in consideration, but most people who are on a diet are not normal weight uh, as, you know, yet that we're studying. So this was also cool. So remember in the beginning I said typically most people did this for average 16 to 20 weeks. Well with this, you know, large range of uh, people, 0 to 50, 0 to 151 weeks was the duration and the average was 44. So that's still a good amount of time, I believe. Uh, 44 weeks, it's almost a whole year, so congrats to those people. Uh, but so that's, you know, again, interesting things to kind of take into consideration. Uh, another crazy stat I thought was at three year FU, I'm just gonna laugh every time with that, 710 subjects, which was 10% of the original 6,000 plus, maintained a weight loss of 5% or more from baseline. So literally 10% of people maintained this 5% weight loss. So that's just crazy to me, you guys. Uh, and, you know, that's, again, something to take into consideration. You know, most weight loss research, when people talk so grimly in the, grimly, is that even a word? Grim, it's so grim, grimly, uh, whatever, I'm just making up words. Uh, in the intro, that's why, you know, because literally out of all these, you know, thousands of people, only some of them maintained 5% weight loss, which, really isn't that much. I mean, if you're overweight, I guess it could be. Uh, it's still great that you maintain some kind of weight loss, but that's not like some substantial number. So that's pretty crazy, I think. Um, now, with the, this is one of the things I'm gonna kind of read verbatim because I want it to be, you know, right at you guys. With the exception of rigid control and restriction of the amount of food, remember we talked about the eight things they looked at, those were two of them. 
the maintenance of behavioral improvements for each of the eight scores was associated with a significantly higher probability of successful weight reduction after three years. The percentage of successful weight reduction increased with the number of behavioral scores for which improvement was maintained and was highest in subjects who maintained five to eight behavioral improvements. Super important to talk about this, you guys. So this is kind of like the bread and butter of this study. When you look at all the things, flexible control of eating, rigid control of eating, meal rhythm, you know, aka not grazing, having more substantial meals, food choices, meal situations, restriction of the amount, physical activity, and coping with stress. If you had, if you improved five of those eight parameters, you had a better chance of maintaining lost body weight. And the more substantial behavior changes that you did, uh, in fact, maintain, the better, the, the greater your success for that weight loss. So said in more logical terms, because sometimes I dance around things. <laughs> And this is why we have research, right? <laughs> Talk about being concise. God, I'm so not concise. The likelihood of, su of success increases with the number of behavioral areas which are involved in the process of change. So again, all of these things are, you know, important for different reasons. So, it, and these aren't the only ones. These are just ones that they studied. And it was just cool that, you know, the more that you had, the more behavioral changes that you had that were lasting, you know, after this year long process, you had a greater percentage of keeping the weight off for three years. So, you know, of course <laughs> they write this. It seems to be much more promising if um, the person has a whole lifestyle change. Of course, we all watching that know, all of us watching this likely know that, but you know, a lot of people don't. So this is really, really important. And this kind of loops back to the first thing that I said, when you're making this large change to your diet, and your just behaviors in general, you know, this does have to be a whole lifestyle. It can't just be, you know, you're looking at this kind of as a forever tool. So uh, the last thing that I do want to point out, which I thought was interesting, the finding that less successful subjects gave up behavioral improvements and relapsed into old behavioral patterns within the first year indicates that the therapeutic support of weight reduction should be continued for at least a year. So Again, this is one study, but this was looking at a large group of people and they weren't, you know, it wasn't an intervention. It was more just asking them how things went. You know, after a year thing, they kind of seemed to, you know, get a better grasp on it. But maybe you need this kind of intervention for at least a year. And I mean, honestly, think about any of your journeys. You know, when we first started out, it didn't, you know, there's always ups and downs no matter how long you've been doing this. But I think it's really, really important um, for people who are overweight you know, we have to look at these therapies and sometimes we look at them as very transient and they really, really need to be you know, longer and it needs to be this instilled process. So maybe it needs to be longer than a year in order to see these types of results. So I will loop back one more time to the, the probably the best part. Best part of this study, I think, is of course showing that behavior change has such a massive impact on weight control. I mean, to a lot of us that seems obvious, but I mean that when we say that seems obvious. A lot of us will engage in behaviors that are not sustainable, behaviors that are not healthy. Uh, and I'm talking to competition prep specifically now, but you know, we're talking about lifestyle change here and long-term weight reduction. They need to be things, you know, do you eat frequently? Do you handle meal situations well? Like, is your stress under control? Are you active? Do you have flexible control over your diet? You know, things that need to be instilled. And I will, like I said, loop, one back, loop back one more time to when they talked about flexible control when you're eating in this approach for weight control, you're looking at this, it's understood as a permanent task. I wanna say that over and over and over again. Uh, and I think that's just a really cool phrase. So again, short, uh, short paper, but that was a ton of information, I thought, and I thought it was uh, really helpful. So again, if you're, I do these for you guys because it's not just for you, it's for if you're a coach, if you are a personal trainer, if you have family members, you know, anyone that you know that this kind of stuff can help, everyone has is in a different place in their journey. So whether you're an advanced listener or you're just, you know, you're just starting out in your fitness journey, I think this can help all of us. So thank you guys so much. Please let me know below, well, of course, if you like this video, <laughs> and then, but most importantly, moving forward, if you wanna see kind of shorter videos uh, or if longer videos are all right, because you guys know how I get with the, uh, Ramble. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you loved the Science Simplified and have a great day.